Uh, R.B. Morris, who's going to be kind of the leading uh, performer, uh, one of the leading performers in, in next week's event, uh, is the guy that introduced me to Sutri personally about 40 years ago in Fort Sanders, where we both lived at the time. Uh, and it was uh, it was a remarkable novel. I was just amazed to see it. I, I did not was not familiar with McCarthy's work before that. Uh, but it, it uh, in in retrospect, uh, I read I've read a lot of essays about it. it Maybe McCarthy's most complex novel. Uh, it's certainly his funniest of the ones I've read, at least. But it's also the most densely Knoxville specific novel that he uh, has ever written, uh, and and probably that anyone has ever written. Uh, literally, it's been in print uh, since 1979. Uh, and I, but I think it's been read more in the last 20 years uh, than it was in the first 20 years of its publication, uh, because uh, I, I checked on Ingram, in fact, the word Sutri, which to my knowledge doesn't exist elsewhere in the English language, uh, peaked in, uh, in print in 2010. Um, and it's still uh, at a fairly high, high point compared to what it was early in the publication of the novel. Uh, so the, uh, I think the uh, novel has been uh, bought and read a lot more in this uh, century than it was in the first 20 years after it was, public, it was published. Cormac McCarthy was born in Rhode Island in 1933, uh, but his father moved uh, here to Knoxville in the very early days of TVA. His father was an attorney who worked for TVA. Uh, Cormac or Charlie, as he was known growing up, uh, grew up here uh, uh, mostly in, on the south side of town on Martin Mill uh, Pike and uh, kind of on the very uh, edge of, of, of city limits and South Knoxville. He grew up attending Catholic schools here in town, um, including Catholic High when it was on Magnolia. Uh, he attended UT uh, during the period when Sutri takes place. He was actually at UT at, at three different periods in the 1950s, although he never he never graduated. He, uh, and during a part of that period, he was he joined the Air Force. He was in Alaska, where, the, where he was stationed for a while, which is a great place probably to, uh, to begin writing. Uh, he later lived in Spain, uh, but he settled in Blunt County for several years, where he was when his first uh, three novels were published. Um, the first one was called The Orchard Keeper. It came out in 1965. It got a lot of very strong academic interest. It's interesting how, how many uh, Ivy League uh, professors were fascinated with The Orchard Keeper in those early days. Um, and uh, but but. But he didn't catch on. Had very little sales. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, in fact, he he published three more novels with reference to his home in varying degrees. Uh, the first four novels are all set to some degree, at least in in uh, the Knoxville area. Uh, Sutri, his fourth, uh, was published when he was forty six uh, years old, and he was then still not known except mainly to uh, to literary uh, people, literary critics, and uh, and professors. Uh, but uh, moved to Texas in the mid 70s, um, but, uh, but returned, and this is something a lot of people don't know, he returned to Knoxville and lived almost under the radar when he was living in the uh, Colony Motel in, uh, in Bearden, right on Keeson Pike. Uh, it, it always lived in very, uh, very uh, austere circumstances, whether it was in Texas or here, but he just lived in a motel room for a couple of years and actually wrote a book uh, that would be known as Blood Meridian while he was living there. And, and it was also when he was there that he won the, the famous Genius uh, Award, the MacArthur Fellowship, uh, uh, that, that got him some national attention. Um, but, uh, but he returned, uh, returned to the West in the 80s, uh, returned, uh, eventually settled in Santa Fe, which is where he lives, uh, where he lives now. He was still best known to literary critics up until the, the early 1990s, best known to literary critics. Uh, none of his novels had sold more than 5,000 copies, even though many of them had gotten great reviews until 1992, when he won the National Book Award for a book called All the Pretty Horses, uh, which uh, not only won the National Book Award, became a, a his first really national bestseller and, not, and, and became uh, the, the, uh, the, the first of several movies. I think Matt Damon was in that one. So he, by 1992, People across the nation knew who Cormac McCarthy was. Uh, in in the in the years since then, all of almost all of his books have become bestsellers and uh, and critical successes, as well. Uh, one uh, one extraordinarily uh, violent book uh, called No Country for Old Men became a movie that won the Oscar for Best Picture in 07. Uh, and meanwhile, it was a great uh, couple of years for him. He had also won the Pulitzer that year for 
uh, a new novel called The Road, uh, which is a, a, a very unusual novel, post-apocalyptic kind of a journey, which also became a movie, um, uh, which was fairly successful. Uh, and he's uh, by that time he was he's been in the 21st century he's considered one of America's greatest living writers. Uh, he uh, he wrote a screenplay for a movie that was less successful than the others called uh, The Counselor in 2013, and uh, has not uh, done movies since then. Has not published a book since that time. There is a book that's set, been said to be in the works for many years called uh, The Passenger. Uh, which uh, has been uh, uh, suspected to be published any t any day now. They say it's a major departure from his other work. In fact, it has a female uh, lead uh, uh, protagonist. Um, but anyway, we're going to go back and talk about Sutri, uh, which I think is is a word that uh, a lot of people were not terribly familiar with. When we suddenly had a, a Sutri Landing Park or a Sutri Tavern. Uh, this is the fourth uh, his fourth of ten novels uh, of all the ones he's published. And the last to be explicitly set in in Tennessee, although the road includes a scene uh, of an apparently uh, of an unnamed city, but an apparently post-apocalyptic uh, Knoxville. Um, uh, the novel Sutri is a an unusual novel. It doesn't have a really strong plot, which is what you think of, and when you think of a novel, but it's a series of adventures and misadventures by a young man named Cornelius Sutri. He was an educated middle class guy, at least in his um, background, but he, he flees uh, his middle class life around 1950 mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to uh, move downtown and live among the, uh, the near homeless, the untouchables of Knoxville, the, the eccentric and, and the disturbed and, uh, um, and petty criminals and, and vagrants uh, of, of, the, uh, of the waterfront shanty towns and other slums of Knoxville, uh, including the area known as uh, McAnally Flats. Um, it, it's, uh, he does all his wandering around downtown Knoxville, mostly on foot, uh, and it, so it's easy to make a, a walking tour of, of Sutri, as I as I have done on occasion. Uh, but uh, but uh, but sometimes in a boat on the river, they go up river in a boat for a while with a with a family looking for for river pearls. Uh, but also, he sometimes travels in a stolen police car, and that's a, a, a brief scene that uh, one of the more uh, 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 more more uh, uh, action and adventure sorts of scenes in the book. Uh, there are lots of characters in this book, which is why it sometimes seems more complicated than some of his other books. It, about 30 characters who are all very distinct and unusual uh, people. Uh, the, mo the best known of them is the guy named Gene Harrigan, uh, who is a kind of a loony hillbilly uh, character uh, who gets in trouble with uh, his his affection for watermelons early in the early in the book. Uh, another character you see uh, more than a lot of the others is a guy named J Bone. Uh, and J Bone in the book uh, it, that he's referred to mostly as J Bone, but in the book he's known also as Jim Long. And this is one of Sutri's best friends. And it's interesting because he is based very much on Cormac McCarthy's best friend growing up, whose name was Jim Long. And uh, it's uh, it's remarkable that Jay Bone is referred to, I don't know of any other book in, in a lot of books, a lot of novels have characters based on real people. But in this case, Jay Bone uh, appears by his real name, Jim Long, at his real address, which was on Forest Avenue, and with his real phone number, or was it Grand, Forest Grand over in Fort Sanders. But they even refer to his actual phone number. And if you look up in the uh, telephone book series directories of 1951. That's that was the phone number of Jim Long, uh, a little uh, a little joke by Cormac McCarthy, but but also uh, demonstrates that all of these characters, perhaps almost all of these characters, are either real people with their real names, or in some cases composites. So we think Harrogate was probably composite of two or three different people. Uh, but other characters are known as Ocean Frog, uh, Tripping Through the Dew, Hoghead, Bucket. Uh, Mother She, um, uh, Ab Jones, uh, Blind Richard, uh, but all these are just were characters of, of Knoxville in uh, circa 1951. The book is set in 1951, but of course uh, the novel was released in 1979. When it came out in 79, the New York Times said, Cormac McCarthy gives us a sense of river life that reads like a doomed Huckleberry Finn. Uh, the Times of London was interested in the book. Uh, it, it wrote that Sutri demonstrates a humor that is Faulknerian in its gentle wryness and a freakish imaginative flair reminiscent of Flannery O'Connor. 
Uh, it's interesting that that both of those people are compared to it because both Faulkner and uh, O'Connor, who are both associated with the Southern Gothic, that uh, is a term that's often applied to uh, McCarthy, both Faulkner and O'Connor uh, openly acknowledge their debt to a, a character named Sut Lovinggood. Uh, and it's interesting that the, the uh, similarity of the name Sutry and Sut, um, uh, Sut Loving Good by George Washington Harris, uh, who lived in Knoxville and, and, and actually was created this character, Sut Loving Good, in, in the era when he lived in Knoxville in the 1850s before the Civil War. Uh, but a, a kind of a loony character. There's really more, he's really more like uh, Carragut than like, uh, than like Sutri. People have, uh, have sometimes called the novel autobiographical. That may be uh, a matter uh, of, uh, of, of um, speculation more than any provable fact. But Sutri and, uh, and McCarthy have several things in common. One is a, a middle-class educated background. Uh, they're both Catholic, uh, they're both divorced, uh, and they both have had a child. Um, uh, and uh, Cormac knew about uh, uh, knew a lot of the people that Sutri knew. And it's interesting that if, if, uh, if Sutri is not autobiographical, you would almost expect a, a character named McCarthy to show up along with all these other characters who knew him. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that's a matter of speculation, as I say. Uh, one difference is that Sutri, Cornelius Sutri, seems to be about 10 years older than Cormac McCarthy was when, he, uh, when, he, uh, when, when the uh, action takes place. Uh, McCarthy was actually still a teenager at the time in 1951 and was a, a freshman at uh, the University of Tennessee and I, at, at the time of the setting of Sutri. So, but he still could have known these names, these people and places uh, at the time because freshmen are known to roam around a bit. Um, but a lot of the characters in the book are real and appear by their real names or something very similar to their real names like Billy Ray Callahan uh, and Tarzan Quinn, um, and as well as J-Bone, as, as I mentioned earlier, who appears by his real name and with his real address and his real phone number in the book. I was uh, grateful to get to know uh, Jay Bone a little bit before he died. He died in 2012 here in Knoxville, and I got to to have a, a good long conversation with him in his house in North Knoxville. Uh, it was uh, he was very proud of his connection to uh, Cormac and and had he actually showed me a picture that I'll hope somebody out there has and can send us a copy of it. I wish I'd gotten a copy that day, but he, he had a, a snapshot of himself. This was not long after Sutri's Tavern had opened, and Jay Bone himself walked into Sutri's Tavern and had a, someone take a picture of him while he was shoving his way into the uh, into the uh, door. Um, but uh, but anyway, I think one of the last times uh, Cormac was in town was to see his his old friend Jim uh, before he died. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, Sutri, the book uh, was little known in Knoxville for about 20 years after it came out when I would talk about it and, and uh, suggest it as, uh, as a theme for, for something like a volunteer landing. Uh, I, I found that most people never heard of it and most people knew little about Cormac McCarthy. Um, but then I think presumably driven by Cormac McCarthy's national fame, especially after all the pretty horses in 92, it became part of our, our our landscape and our culture in different ways. Uh, we have uh, we had an inscription on Volunteer Landing in the 90s, uh, and then a few years later on Market Square, we have an inscription from Sutri as well about Market Square. Uh, but this was like 25 years after the novel came out that these things started popping up. Uh, and of course, Sutri's Tavern uh, opened uh, over 10 years ago, and uh, and more, more recently, Sutri Landing, a great uh, riverfront park on the south side uh, opened uh, about what four or five years ago. Um, but uh, but I, I was involved in a few things called the Sutri Stagger, which was a, a literary pub crawl. We had the first one, I think back in 2000 or so, had three or four before uh, we did one for a uh, Big Cormac McCarthy conference here in Knoxville in, in 2009. Uh, but the Sutri Stagger was a, a series of, it's a pub crawl, a, a place like a literary place where we would go to places he described and we'd go to the nearest bar and, and have some dramatic readings in there and had some watermelon snacks on, along the way. Uh, we drew uh, 50 or 60 people these things and they lasted about 12 hours and believe it or not most of the people uh, stayed with it the whole time. Um, the, uh, uh, I, was, I was impressed when we the last time we did the long version of it uh, that some of the scholars at the conference uh, from Australia, from Great Britain, Scotland, other places could quote long passages of, of Sutri, 
Uh, so this was not just something that people in Knoxville were obsessed with. It was a, it's a global, a global thing. And I was impressed uh, four years ago when I met uh, an NPR, well-known NPR reporter uh, named Steve Inskeep, when he was in town touting his own, own book about Andrew Jackson. Uh, we started, uh, I mentioned Carmen uh, uh, McCarthy, and he just immediately began quoting from Sutri. I, I, I was really amazed that this guy who has, uh, has, has reported about, uh, he'd been a, a war correspondent in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, was uh, was a guy that still was carrying around all these paragraphs. He could quote more Sutri than I could, um, but that was. Uh, but he really wanted to see the places where these things happen. And after his book signing that night at the Bijou Theater, we did we walked around some and walked under bridges at ten o'clock at night, looking at uh, the places described in the book. But uh, anyway, the, the Larry Pub Curl is easy to do with Sutri because he describes he doesn't disguise anything. Everything appears by its real name as it was in 1951, uh, and there are probably 30 or 40 specific locations, all real and described as they were. So this makes this very uh, valuable to uh, to uh, to Knoxville to Knoxville history. Um, one we'll talk about later. The the huddle is is one in particular. We we have a picture of that as it is now but it's kind of a home base for the uh for the novel uh and uh uh but let's say yeah i, I think at this point maybe we, we might as well go into uh the uh the pictures that uh that paul and i have we the main days taken this morning paul and i did some some walking around uh, town this one wasn't taken this morning this is an early early picture of the riverfront that uh that Cormac mccarthy describes uh, long before he knew it this is probably from 120 years ago but this is uh, the old uh, the old wharf area where, where they would load uh, uh, riverboats with with cargo uh, and or unload also uh, and riverboats would come would go from here down to uh, you know down to, to Kingston down to uh, Muscle Shoals down to other places Chattanooga of course and and would uh, would come back and forth and sometimes go upriver to to the French Broad especially and uh, so we had a good deal of river traffic in those early days. Let's look at the next one, Paul. All right, this is the one closer to Sutri's time. Uh, this is from, I think, 1946 or seven. Uh, this is a, 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 one of the largest river boats that ever, that's ever been, uh, ever, ever made, made all the way up to Knoxville uh, from the Mississippi River. This is called the Gordon Green. Uh, but I think that's the reason the picture was taken. This, this uh, is a large picture that uh, we found that's actually in my, in my, uh, uh, in my office. Uh, but this uh, this uh, this is the riverfront as as Cornelius Sutri would have known it. Uh, it's kind of uh, not anything pretty. It's a place that flooded occasionally, so they didn't build uh, uh, fancy buildings down there. They're mainly warehouses and stuff uh, down there. But this is a picture of of uh, of the riverfront. Almost all these buildings are are still there. The Baptist Church and uh, the the general building you can see. The only one I I know of that you can see really clearly that's not in the picture is uh well the standpipe over on the right side that was the old uh water tower uh, but also a uh the old empire building which is just uh, at the, when you see the holston building uh over to the left uh, there's a, a shorter uh, uh gray building and that was the the empire building the first building in knoxville to have elevators um but that was torn down in the 70s but the other buildings i think are all still there uh next one please all right, this was taken this morning down on the riverfront. This is volunteer landing uh, where it goes right down to the, to the water. Uh, and there are hawser, hawsers for tying up boats here. Uh, but this is almost exactly, and I've talked to uh, affirm this with the author's brother, this is where, uh, uh, where, the, uh, where Sutri's uh, houseboat was tied up. Uh, back then it was just a muddy bank and hardly anybody uh, would, uh, would, would, uh, uh, would want to spend a lot of time down there. And a lot of people didn't want to spend time down there in 1951, but this was a place where there's actually a double decker a houseboat that was parked there for quite a long time that people lived in that caught uh, captured Cormac McCarthy's imagination according to his brother, Dennis. Uh, and uh, and you can see the Henley Street Bridge in the background. And, uh, and this is uh, roughly uh, parallel, uh, uh, connects to uh, about where Market Street is, doesn't correct, Directly, but about where Market Street would come down at uh, at what was called uh, it was once called Prince Street. This is where the old wharf was. Um, but uh, anyway, a nice one, please, Paul. 
but this is where we always used to start our Sutri staggers at down at that at that point. This is uh, the Henley Street Bridge from Volunteer Landing, and uh, the Henley Bridge uh, uh, figures in the novel uh, in in a few ways, but but in, in one respect, there's a, a a guy known as the Rag Picker. And he lived under the bridge and under bridges, if you don't have a, a home, under a bridge is a, is, a, is, a, is a prime place to live. Uh, the rag picker lived uh, over uh, in the place that's uh, opposite here in, uh, in the, uh, in, in the, uh, on the south side of the river. But uh, anyway, this is, uh, Henley Bridge was built in 1930 and uh, is, is a lovely piece of architecture with some literary uh, cachet as well. And you, you can see the, uh, Church Street Methodist Church in the background. Next one, please. All right, here's the Gay Street Bridge, which figures in the novel as well. There's a suicide uh, briefly described in the novel uh, with uh, kind of the, the mystery of that, that happens more than once that people take their shoes off before they jump in the, jump in the water for the last time. It, it's, it's, a, it's a quirk of human nature, somehow that happens over and over. But, uh, but there's a discussion, a description of fishing out the body and, and uh, kind of some, some startlement that the, that the person was not, uh, was not, not still ticking, but as his, his clock was, his, his watch was. So that, that's, uh, that's one of the, lots of the little ironies that you find in, in Sutri. But this, this bridge is, is, uh, is intact. It's been uh, greatly improved about 20 years ago, but it's the original 1897 bridge, as you can see on this plaque. Uh, it was actually not open until 1898, but, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the first uh, really, really, really permanent bridge across the, the Gay, Gay Street. And, you know, the same, the same bridge we drive across is the same bridge that, uh, that uh, the outlaw Kid Curry rode the you know, stolen horse across in 1903 and never to be seen alive again. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot, this bridge is, uh, is fascinated a lot of people, including Graham McCarthy and David Madden as well. Next one, please. All right, this is something uh, uh, I mentioned, uh, living under a bridge is, is ideal for a lot of homeless people. And this, uh, this is a spot that uh, is described very specifically in the novel. This is, uh, this is Harrogate's lair. This is the place that Gene Harrogate lived. And it was one of the best places in town for a homeless person to live. Back then, it did not have a, a, a gate on it. That's actually a, a fairly recent addition uh, to keep homeless people out of out of there because they were actually living, still living in there, as recently as seven or eight years ago. And in fact, while Paul and I were down here taking this picture this morning, uh, I walked around the corner and uh, and and startled a homeless guy who was actually lying just on the other side of this concrete structure to the right of here and uh he was uh, it's a different era for homeless people today because they have smartphones and he was there playing with a smartphone um but uh but he was we were equally startled to see each other uh, but uh anyway this is a place that uh I, 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 that's that's fascinating scholars we it's always been on the uh on the trail you see the craighead jackson house in the background to the left but on i i knew about it it, it wasn't it, it, I didn't realize that it used to be so accessible from that side. I would always access accessed it from the uh, parking garage, uh, the Dwight Kessel garage, uh, which is on the right of the scene here, and we climb over the uh, the uh, railing there. But I think uh, the Blunt Mansion and Craig Ed Jackson people are interested in the, the prospect of making that part of the uh, attraction of visiting Blunt Mansion. But Paul noticed that uh, that there's a, an inscription here uh, uh, that says Sutri lives down here, people, uh, people who come down here know about the, the connection to the novel. But this is uh, the, the place where the loony uh, character, uh, Gene, Gene Harrogate, lived for, for a good chunk of the novel uh, and, a, and a great place to live by, by his standards it was. Next one, please, yeah. And uh, there's a place in the novel where they talk about the Cheshire clock uh, and it just very poetically about the Cheshire clock and he's talking about the courthouse clock which was illuminated from the inside somehow that you could see the clock itself uh, but could not in, in certain weather conditions when it was foggy and dark uh, you could not see the actual tower you could only see the clock uh, as if uh, as if it's just levitated in the middle of the air uh, and that's why he called it the Cheshire clock because it was like the Cheshire cat's uh, grin um, 
but you could see it down from the from the river, uh, as uh, as Cetric described, as Cormac McCarthy describes it. Next one, please. All right, there's some scenes uh, that take place in the old Lamar House, which was a very cheap hotel in the uh, 1950s. Uh, there's some scenes where they look out the window, uh, and I think that's they were up there when when uh, McCarthy uh, describes the city of Knoxville and says this obscure and prismatic city and uh, was uh, found yeah, useful to use that word. I always liked that, that my, my favorite, very short description of my hometown um, that, uh, that, that uh, we used that uh, for a the title of a book uh, a few years ago. But, uh, but this, they, the, the Bijou itself is not, uh, is not a setting for the novel, but this, this hotel above it, above it was. And just around the corner from there, is, uh, very conveniently, uh, is, uh, is the huddle. Uh, which is a, a place uh, that 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 I remember the sign. I never went in there, but it was a, a an interesting bar. It was here that black awning is over the old uh, entrance to the huddle. It's uh, it was just ignored and kind of abandoned uh, as the lower part of this place called Cook Lofts is probably more and more more uh, upscale, expensive places to stay overnight in downtown Knoxville is Cook, Cook Lofts, is 1924 building. Uh, but the uh, the huddle was on the ground, kind of basement level. Uh, if you're looking at it from the Gay Street elevation, um, but this was uh, uh, it was a long, narrow bar that was uh, still open until about 1980, uh, around that time. Uh, but was uh, uh, but was abandoned for a long time, and then was a series of businesses. It was a, a gaming shop for a while, and an art uh, gallery for a while, and I think a yoga like a yoga place for a while. Now it appears to be possibly uh, just a private residence. There's a, a warning on the door that, uh, that you're on camera if you walk up to the door, which Paul and I didn't actually do. But, uh, but uh, anyway, it's, uh, uh, that's, that's exactly where the huddle was. It was there from 19, uh, it was fairly new at the time that Sutri uh, would have known it. Um, and it was a, a, a place that welcomed everybody. It had a reputation as a gay bar later, but I, I think that was mainly because it was a place that everybody uh, went that may not have felt welcome at the other bars downtown. And that included prostitutes, included gay people, included lots of uh, Sutri's friends. Uh, but that was, uh, that was the huddle that was there for uh, kind of a Knoxville institution for about 30 years or so. Um, and uh, was uh, was there that whole time, and and just had used to have a big uh, sign that said the huddle outside. Next one, please. All right, there's uh, descriptions in the book of, uh, especially in the introduction of uh, of the uh, the graveyard the, or boneyard, as they call it, and this is the one they're describing, which is the old uh, graveyard on, at the Presbyterian Church on State Street. Uh, it's been used since the 1790s. But a lot of interesting people, uh, interesting people buried there. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is uh, the S and W. There's some discussion, the uh, stories told about the S and W. Um, and uh, this was a 1937 uh, Art Deco, very futuristic for the time cafeteria, very uh, very stylish uh, uh, place uh, in the, to go to have. Uh, have a meal and eat almost any time of day, well, lunch and supper especially. But people, we, we, we got to go in there and they let us take some pictures. This is the interior. This is where the old cafeteria was where people used to eat. Uh, but there's a scene in there involving, a, a pretty hilarious scene involving the, the legendary lawyer, John R. Neal, uh, who uh, was known for uh, for wearing, uh, being, being a very no-nonsense kind of guy about his wardrobe. He, he didn't, uh, when his belt broke, he thought he didn't want to waste money on buying a belt, so he just tied his pants with with a rope, and and went to court that way. He had, actually, had a law school uh, down the street. Um, but uh, eccentric guy was involved in the early days of uh, of TVA, and uh, was uh, was actually was was uh, John Scope's uh, attorney down at, uh, at along with Clarence Darrow down at Dayton in 1925. But uh, McCarthy told about a mishap ha having to do with that rope coming undone at an inopportune, inopportune time when the uh, everybody at the s &W discovered that not only did he not use belts, he didn't uh, wear underwear as well. But, but uh, anyway, this is, uh, this is the, the well-known uh, kind of semi-spiral staircase that went up there that used to be alongside the uh, organist at the bottom. 
but I think they've done a great job with kind of keeping the spirit of that Art Deco space uh, and then this beauty school there. Uh, next one, please. All right, this is the old Miller's building. And it's uh, this course is before Sutri's time, but we just thought we'd show this uh, historical uh, picture uh, at the corner of, uh, of uh, Union and Gay Street. Uh, it's, uh, it looks different now, but it's the same building. Uh, we can see the old Kiritids and there. They've been reconstructed up there as, as well, thanks to Duane Greaves work. Um, but this is, uh, uh, this is a place that uh, Sutri and his friends didn't shop there. It was too expensive to shop, but they would go there on a hot summer day. And, and I think of Sutri as a summer book, even though there are winter scenes in there. I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the book takes place in very hot weather, and they they walk into uh, Miller's just to cool off. It was one of the few air conditioning air conditioned buildings downtown that you just walk into in those days, and, and I'm sure they weren't the only ones who who did that. Uh, next one, please. All right, here is there there a lot, there's a much description description of Market Square in Sutri, and also in his earlier work, uh, uh, The Orchard Keeper. In fact, that probably has more lush descriptions of Market Square than Sutri does. But Sutri describes Market Square in in, in great great detail. Uh, I want to just mention a, a, a little bit of it here. Uh, from uh, uh, he he went among vendors and beggars and wild street creatures, haranguing a lost world with a vigor unknown to the sane. I love that phrase. Uh, he passed under the shade of the market house where brick and Brick the color of dried blood, rose turreted and cupolate and crazed into the heat of the day. Uh, form on form in demented accretion without precedent or counterpart in the annals of architecture. Pigeons bobbed and preened in the high barbicans or shat from the blackened parapets. Anyway, this is a, <clears throat> a picture of, uh, of the front of the market house. Is, uh, this may be, um, uh, is this one of, uh, I, I can't remember. The origin of this of this photo, Paul. Do you, do you know? Is this one of uh, Amory's? Well, it's, it's later than the Jim Thompson one, and it's uh, kind of a little preview of the, the footage we're hopefully going to see. Uh, yeah, that Eric's put together as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. yeah. It's but probably yeah, it's probably forties. Yeah, Market House. Uh, for, it was there from eighteen ninety seven to nineteen sixty, and it was torn down. It, a lot of people say it was burned down. It it was it. There was a fire there. But it was not a ruinous fire. It was actually deliberately torn down as part of a city plan a few months after the fire, uh, which only uh, affected a few businesses. But uh, a fascinating place with lots and lots of history. But here's Market Square today, uh, just a, a great place. It's, uh, it's where everybody went 100 years ago and it's where everybody goes today. It's uh, just a, a you know, fascinating place to just hang out and, and watch people. All right, here's the old Roxy Theater. And uh, there was a time that I would give a talk and all the old men would remember the Roxy Theater. And I, I'm not sure how many there are still who do remember it. But, uh, but this was a, uh, a place that had uh, cowboy movies for kids in the daytime and, uh, and striptease shows at night. Um, but it said, uh, it says Nossel's only uh, year round vaudeville house. Uh, but, uh, but it was, uh, uh, interesting, uh, it's showing a, a movie called Damaged Lives, kind of an exploitation film. Anyway, that's this here's the same the same uh, uh, setting today. This is uh, this is that uh, a kind of mixed use apartment building with the retail on the on the, on the ground floor. Uh, the Roxy was torn down probably uh, fifty or sixty years ago, and actually moved to North Knoxville, where uh, uh, it was used as an auto uh, an auto parts uh, or an annex to an auto part Eddie's Auto Parts was bought it and moved it up there and it served several purposes at his complex up there over the years. It didn't look like a theater anymore, but it was the same building. But uh, anyway, next one. All right, here's a, a, a building that surprises people and we showed it a few weeks ago for another purpose. But a lot of people are reading the book, they say, what, what was the terminal, the Union Terminal, the terminal building, what was that? And uh, this is what it, what it was, it was on Gay Street uh, and it was built about 1930. Uh, was the main bus terminal for Knoxville, uh, for all of the Knoxville bus lines, including uh, Trailways and Greyhound and several others, uh, smaller ones, uh, that all met here. And there was a big arcade in the middle with uh, shopping and barbers and all sorts of things in there. But they walked through the uh, arcade building uh, several times in the novel, and, uh, and this is what they're talking about. This was here as a, as a bus terminal to about 1960. I just did some research today, 
it actually was here longer than I realized. It, it uh, actually burned uh, in the early 70s, I think 1974, and it's been just an empty, uh, an empty hole since then. But we have a picture of it today, and there, there it is. Uh, it looks like some some stuff is likely to be uh, built in there in there uh, soon. But uh, that's the Cal Johnson building in the background and the Mass General Store on the right. But uh, all right. All right, here's another, uh, I mentioned that Cormac McCarthy was Catholic and grew up in a Catholic family. There is a scene involving him coming kind of very sentimental return to, uh, to the Immaculate Conception uh, Catholic Church, which is our neighbor up here on, on Gallows Hill. Uh, but this is the church that Cormac and his family went to in the, when he was growing up in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, and he describes it uh, in the book, uh, this, this uh, moment of just walking into uh, mainly an agreeable moment of, of going into this old church that he knew so well as a child um, and, uh, and now felt kind of an outcast from his family. But uh, next one. All right, this is a, uh, there's a, there's a scene in Sutri that go, where they go down to Central, which was sometimes known as the Bowery, uh, even in those days. But uh, there's a description central where loud and shoddy commerce, commerce erupted out of the dim shops into the streets and packs of scarred dogs wandered, shouldering his way through dark shoppers in a market ripe with sweat in the incendiary breath of Splow drinkers. Uh, Splow, uh, you may know, was a, uh, the African-American term for moonshine, and that was what they called uh, what, they, uh, what they served uh, for Splow. It was also a term that was sometimes used for canned heat, but, uh, but it, uh, anyway, that's, uh, it was a, it was a, a, a fascinating place, uh, and kind of an exotic uh, place in the 1940s and 50s, but, but, uh, I've heard other, other writers, including the late David Hunter, who died earlier this year, uh, was very fond of, of, uh, the same strip, uh, around the same time or a little bit later, but, uh, all right, and then here, uh, finally, here, uh, here's the corner lounge. This is where we wrapped up our last big uh, Sutri stagger when we walked from the riverfront all the way up to, uh, to uh, kind of the uh, north central area, kind of the downtown north, they call it now. But the corner lounge has been there since the 30s. Uh, there's, it's uh, the site of a brief scene in Sutri where Sutri actually uh, uh, has been in the hospital at St. Mary's. He actually escapes from the hospital in the first place he goes is the corner lounge for a beer. Uh, just to kind of get uh, normalize himself with people he knew, um, and uh, but it's been just a. It, it, I think it's probably fancier now than it was in his time. Uh, it, it very, it's a great bar, though. By the way, and I've been really surprised to, to learn that Eugenia Williams was a was a regular there, and about the same time that that Sutri was. All right, and one more thing. Uh, a lot of people, the other thing that people ask about besides the Union Terminal is McAnally Flats. And a lot of people assume that it was near the river. It was not. McAnally Flats was on the northwest side of downtown, uh, kind of adjoining what's now Mechanicsville. Uh, it was sort of to the uh, southwest of Mechanicsville uh, and just a, 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 an inexpensive uh, neighborhood of, 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 of where people lived. And, and there are a lot of scenes. and in Sutri based at McNally Flats. McNally Flats was mostly torn down, uh, not just for urban renewal, but for the interstate uh, system, which you can see too plainly here. This is the interstate uh, overpasses over uh, 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 Middlebrook Pike uh, down there. And that's where a lot of the, the setting of McNally Flats took place. I, I don't know for sure. Uh, I've seen some descriptions of where McNally Flats ended and, and Mechanicsville started, but uh, I, I can't tell you exactly what this this place looked like. If you have old pictures of McAnally Flats, I would love to see, we would love to, to, to copy them. But uh, all right, that, I, I think that's it. Okay, we have some other suggestions if you want to find out more about Sutri. There are actually several uh, things online, aids online that we know about. And here's, uh, here's one that uh, I, I think uh, our, our board president, uh, Casey Fox and Wes Morgan work together on, on, uh, on this one. Uh, but a, uh, and here's, here's a link to it if you want to look, uh, look for that particular website. And, uh, and, uh, and here's uh, Wes's own uh, website that's been up for quite a few years now. If you want to look uh, at the, he's taking pictures of the real places as they are today, uh, and if you want to find a lot of a lot more obscure places that I talked about tonight, are listed on on Wes's uh, great website. 
And uh, uh, Larry Knox, this is a, 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 a UT uh, English department project that has uh, several uh, uh, Knoxville related uh, authors and, and connections uh, to them. But uh, anyway, well, that's, uh, that's, that's it for me. That's kind of just an introduction to the stuff I think people should know about uh, this novel, whether you read it or not it's not it's not a novel for everybody uh and whether you're familiar with it uh but you ought to know something about it so that and uh, and I, if only to better enjoy the event next week so and i hope to see everybody there well yeah thanks jack um just briefly tell you how this this came together um i started can you guys hear me okay by the way yeah um so I started working in Tamas around 2013. And uh, by that time, I'd already read Sutri maybe five or six times. And the, the very first film collection I transferred had images of uh, boats on the river, the houseboats uh, that Sutri from the 1950s. And uh, being familiar with Sutri, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then soon after that, uh, saw footage of the goat man um, who appears in the book and who some of you might remember from being around. And again, it was like an interesting, you know, connection to Sutri. And then Vic Wells, uh, who was a new stringer in town, uh, shot footage in the Knox County Workhouse, uh, which is, appears in, in Sutri. A description of it's very vivid. So more and more of these things started turning up. And I, I was thinking, you know, Tamas has always done a lot of, um, public screenings since Bradley uh, Reeves and Louisa Trott founded it back in 2005. That's been a huge part of their mission. So wanted to keep doing that. And uh, the idea of a, making a film, archival film based on this Sutri footage came to mind. So I just kept taking notes and remembering things uh, we'd come across until uh, 2018. Um, UT was having a uh, McCarthy author fest and Bill Hardwick from there, uh, contacted me to see if Tamas might want to do some collaboration. And it's like, well, here's the chance to put this Sautry film together. And in a completely other bizarre story you may or may not know, we contacted uh, a German band that had come here in the 90s because they loved Sautry so much and recorded a couple of uh, albums they called Imaginary Soundtracks for that. So we did that uh, show at the Bijou. Uh, that was a lot of fun. It was really interesting. Um, but then Big Ears uh, wanted to do something with Tamas this year, and I, I pitched this sort of in a re-edited, reconfigured way with different musicians. So uh, even if you went to the Bijou uh, presentation, this one's going to be different in many ways, not just the music, but the editing. Um, what, one of the major things is that, that the Buddy in the Huddle presentation included photos from one of their band members, Roland Kopp, but also Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach who was a Swiss journalist, photojournalist, who came to Knoxville in 1937, 1941, and took a lot of photos. Um, originally, I wanted to use McClung, uh, McClung collection, which Tamas is a part of, and Tamas photos, but this was too good of a, you know, a, a combination to pass up, um, so we went with those. And a few of these photos are going to be included in this presentation as well, the one that will occur next Thursday, um, but it's primarily McClung and, um, Tamas ones. But if you want to go ahead and play the uh, the video, we're going to see several McClung collection photos, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, this is, we're going to introduce each sort of section with just a little bit of, of text. R.B. Morris, of course, will be reading. Uh, and then in other sections, there'll, there'll be a little bit of text like this. And just as Jack was saying, you can see there are specific places named. If you've never read the novel, it's uh, it's a really interesting sort of map of Knoxville. Here he's describing uh, walking up from the, the river where he lives to Market Square. And th th this is thread throughout the book, these sort of uh, vivid descriptions and locations. Um, these pictures are gonna go by fairly quickly. We're not gonna linger on them in the, the way that the Jack's PowerPoint did, but um, there you go. That's a McClung uh, collection photo. There's Woodruff's, of course, which was mentioned. And uh, that's a, a wonderful Clark and Jones uh, the billboard, a photo uh, we found from that. Circuit Brothers, of course, with a great 
don't know if you can share the screen any larger. Oh, and there's, you can see the blue circle sign. That's Leonard Chersky, who will show up later in the film. He ran the Three Feathers Bar down there on the corner of uh, Jackson and Gay. And now we're getting into Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach's photos. Again, these are a little bit earlier. We tried to source a lot of the footage, as much footage as possible, from around the time the book took place, uh, 1951. But, you know, uh, this is kind of a, this isn't a documentary. This isn't a narrative film. It's sort of an impressionistic kind of look at the city uh, around the time Sutri would have been. So uh, give ourselves like 10 years or so on either side of that. And uh, these Schwarzenbach photos would have been taken in the either 37 or 41. And they're just so vivid. They're just so, such great photos of downtown and Market Square that uh, I think they definitely you know, have a place uh, in this piece. She traveled with a woman um, named uh, Barbara Wright. And uh, now there's the Rialto, uh, it had closed by 1946. So obviously that's the way, as are the cars. But at the same time, yeah, Sutri probably would have been downtown uh, a few years before. So, but uh, Anne Marie Schwarzenbach traveled with a woman named Barbara Wright, who also took some photographs. Sometimes, like just from a slightly different angle, they obviously had similar interests. Uh, and also Carson McCullers, the the famous Southern author, they had a relationship and traveled. And of course, that's just a beautiful photo of uh, the Market House. Again, a little bit earlier than the 50s. And the Rialto again. And there's the gold uh, Sun Cafe, which of course is mentioned in the novel. And it was on the northwest corner of, of Market Square. And that, that's a wonderful photo from a uh, amateur photographer uh, who worked at TVA that, that got a good photograph of the market there. And, th and that one's from 1928, actually. I, I know because I, I zoomed in on that kid's uh, button. It's an Al Smith for president button. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a Schwarzenbach photo, which we actually used as a poster because it's so century -esque. Here's the uh, riverfront with uh, with the mortuary uh, 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 cars, which she thought were symbolic. Yeah, th these photos are just so powerful. Again, it, it's the Schwarzenbach. The Andrew Johnson in the background. <laughs> And that's obviously under the bridge. This is outside of Knoxville, but it's a wonderful photo, so I wanted to share it. And there's Anne Marie Schwarzenbach herself. This photo is not in the film, but I just wanted to uh, include that to acknowledge her. And now we're going to be moving into uh, some, some WBIR footage of uh, Market Hall, which, uh, again, I'm not sure how many people who are watching might uh, remember this, but. Uh, it's from 1957, and, and there'll be uh, a little bit of this that was actually from news footage after the fire in there. As Jack said, it wasn't a devastating. It didn't completely destroy everything. So we could still get some exterior shots of uh, Market Hall uh, from that after, after the fire. It's a little, I don't know if this is my connection or if you experience this as well, but it's a little staggered. The footage is, uh, will run more smoothly when it's being projected at the uh, event. So, you know, we, so much uh, than there, here we are inside here where you can actually see the salts and. They, they got new Sutri of it. Probably. And everyone I've spoken to, and I know Bradley would always say, Bradley Reeves would always say this too, everyone who remembers the hall remembers the smell. And it's the smell of fish, which is uh, fitting because, of course, Sutri's trade is, is a fisherman uh, for much of the novel, and he brings fish to sell at the market. And this is after the fire when some guys are going in to uh, investigate. So it's wonderful to have this footage. I mean, I we have so much footage in town. I would think we'd see more of Market Hall, but uh, 
th there isn't really a whole lot. That's great, Eric. And now, uh, coming up here, we're going to see um, the Goat Man, which again, I don't know how many of you remember when he would travel through. It was certainly before my time, but um, WBR news footage, they got a, a story on him when he came through. Uh, Charles Chaz McCartney, he, he traveled all over the country, I guess primarily along the east and the south um, for years. And there's a there's a vivid description in the novel, brief, but uh, nonetheless, it made a, enough of an impression on uh, McCarthy that he included the Goatman a couple of times. Yeah, it's a pretty funny scene in the uh, in the post office lawn mm -hmm. when, when they're grazing there, and the policeman tells him to you can't graze your goats there, and he, he says he I, he can't help it; he, they do what they want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read that he uh, you know he's sort of semi-retired, but then he got infatuated with Morgan Fairchild, the actress, and uh, traveled. He hitchhiked to Los Angeles to uh, <laughs> meet her and was mugged uh, no. um, and then came <laughs> I, I don't know how true that is. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, th there's a whole, so much of the novel takes place uh, in, in taverns and there's bootleg whiskey throughout. And so this is sort of a nod to that. This footage is actually shot in Cock County um, outside of Newport. Uh, they're moonshining uh, still. Um, they're, they're filming an illegal activity. Uh, I, I guess the statute of limitations might have passed, but um, you know, of course, there's a scene in the book where they, where Sutri and, and friend travel to Newport uh, for, for quite a while time, and uh, several scenes where they they get bootleg whiskey, uh, both in town and in in Cock County. So that, that's wonderful footage. And then here we have a great photo of, of Knoxville. Um, it's actually from 1962. Uh, but again, I mean, the cars would give that away. But as far as I know, it, it's, it's really the only photo of the huddle I've seen. So we wanted to include that. And this is intended, of course, the dissolve that here we're going inside the huddle. Um, it's not the huddle. It is, as I mentioned earlier, the Three Feathers sandwich shop on the corner of uh, Gay and Jackson. There's Leonard Shursky, the owner. Arthur Q. Smith, the songwriter, is sitting at the bar there, uh, right to the, on the right. Um, yeah, and look at these giant goblets they're drinking from. Uh, the light in here would suggest this was filmed in the daytime, and, uh, you know, it's a packed bar, and people are enjoying themselves. So it's sort of across the street from WNOX, so a lot of musicians would, like Arthur Q. Smith would come over and hang out and really it's quite rare to have footage filmed inside a tavern this was around 1951 or two so this would have been you know three feathers is not mentioned but uh, surely this might have been a such uh hang out at some point and again just to you know the person who filmed this we think owned a shop around the corner. Um, and this is the only reel we have, but um, he just went in and sort of gave an overview of the place. Now, what this guy's going to leave, and we're going to cut to actually footage from the Knoxville Police Department. Uh, this short film they did of a, um, it's sort of like, an, an, I guess, an educational film or trying to warn of the dangers of drunk driving. So uh, there we have, the, you know, this guy's coming out from Wormser, which I, that was on the 500 block, I believe. So uh, again, just stitching all this together, we've gone from a photo down on the, the corner, the huddle is on Cumberland. So Cumberland Gay down to uh, Jackson Gay and then back up to the 500 block. But hopefully the idea is that if you're not from Knoxville, you don't know or really care. <laughs> that and it, it just sort of uh, works together. And he's going to end up here by the, the Gay Street Viaduct. Um, So again, I, I think that's one thing some people who, who, you know, can't really countenance this novel or enjoy it. It's so many scenes in the taverns and of drunkenness and, and brawls and et cetera is something that they're not um, terribly uh, maybe like so much, but it's, it's a big part of the story. There's, there's an affection and humanity though about the whole novel that, that 
it makes nobody look seem worthless. They're all Absolutely. they all kind of play their part in the in this fascinating drama. Yeah. And here's what I, more or less outtakes, and I've, I've included these just to give you an idea of how this was assembled. Again, it's not a documentary, and I'm not, we weren't really trying to create a narrative, although some things, like the workhouse and like the tavern scenes, sort of work like a narrative, and it's it's not just footage of downtown Knoxville, like this here. Um, and, you know, I consider this because it includes uh, views that aren't included elsewhere. Uh, the Walgreens will show up here. It's mentioned in the novel once, but just because it's mentioned, it's sort of like not that, um, doesn't necessarily mean it's the uh, a, a crucial sort of setting. Of course, well, we skipped the part, the bank sign. Well, and there you go. The marquee on the Riviera that would give this away is 1957, and the cars are also a giveaway. Hotel Arnold, um, you know, again, I was thinking for a while to include a scene that Jack was talking about, about uh, Sutri and this woman in a hotel. We don't have footage of the Lamar house, uh, so the Hotel Arnold was going to serve as the stand-in for that. Um, WBR news footage again, they went in there right before they were going to close in 64 and got some really fantastic uh, footage inside there. And I imagine, I, I don't know, but I, I think at this point, the Hotel Arnold would have been a place that, you know, a, a cheaper place that people might have been living, uh, such as this woman, um, not just sort of passing through, but like Sutri and uh, Joyce in the novel, um, across the street or down the street at a Lamar house. Now, this is a really interesting piece of business. This is um, Jasper Jack Hatton, who advertised himself as a fortune teller from East Asia. And he is in court because he told the fortune of Eleanor Watkins, uh, who was the first uniformed police officer, woman police officer, rather, in Knoxville. And she went undercover and asked him how she could get her husband back. And he charged her $13 to read her fortune, gave her some love potion and some pussyfoot oil. And uh, Eleanor Watkins, who you can see there um, testifying, came in with her, uh, the partner who's, who's next to her there and uh, basically arrested him. Uh, I looked this guy up and he, he, I think he's from Florida originally, and um, he had a case against the Florida Supreme Court in which he won. I guess, I think they got him for fortune telling. But the correlation in the book is a character named Mother She, who um, Sutri visited, visits and she has all of these potions and elixirs. And it's kind of similar to what we're about to see here on the, the desk, the sort of things that Prophet Hatton was using. So that was active. That was going on in Knoxville. Um, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, good luck potion and love potion and pussyfoot oil, which I'll admit I've never heard of before this. But and then here we have uh, the, the Chisholm Tavern, which uh, included in the Buddy in the Huddle version, but it's getting construction. It wasn't a functional tavern at the time. It's kind of a strange story anyway, because it was supposed to be Knoxville's oldest extant building at the time, but it wasn't the original. It had been rebuilt. And as early as 1950, there was um, a movement for renovation underway uh, that, that finally got going around 1957, and that's what we're seeing here. They actually moved this building 50 feet over from where it originally was, down on uh, Front Street by the river. And uh, we're going to renovate it, but it, they just couldn't raise the money and there just wasn't enough interest and as you could tell it's pretty dilapidated and uh it was torn down in 1965. but yeah okay so that that is also the art footage and that's it for the little the sneak peek again uh the, most of this stuff except the outtakes you saw there are going to be included in the uh film we're showing next thursday at uh nine o'clock at sunset at uh, Lakeshore Park. We're going to have live music. Uh, R.B. Morris, of course, will be doing some reading. And uh, it should be interesting. As Jack said, I think that uh, even if you're not familiar with the book, I think you'll get more out of it. Of course, if you're familiar with the book, you'll recognize scenes and locations. But even if you're not, uh, the film alone, and uh, if you're interested in Old Knoxville and the music will be worthwhile. Well, th thanks a lot, Eric. This, that was great. I'm glad it worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too.